So this session will be recorded, uh, and that way people who are not able to participate today can um, watch the whole presentation. Uh, today we have a special focus chat. It is on labeling of museum objects, which is a very important thing to do, uh, is to label your objects. It's part of inventory control, and it's one of the fundamental things we do in the museum field. And Ellen Carley, the conservator at the Alaska State Museum, has uh, very generously agreed to spend her time with us today, uh, giving us the ins and outs of uh, labeling from her experience uh, over many, many years of labeling objects. And um, I think I will just turn it over to Ellen. Hi, folks. Um, I have a little PowerPoint here for you. And uh, that'll take, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And then we will um, take some questions. I have a little video, like 20 second video we're going to attempt after the PowerPoint, see if that works. And then there'll be a bunch of time for questions. So let's get started. I kind of tried to distill down the workshop I gave at the Museums Alaska Conference into three major concepts I wanted people to walk away with. And these are the three. Labels should never harm the artifact. Labels need to be durable but reversible. And redundancy is good. I'm assuming I don't have to give the whole spiel to you folks about why we need to put numbers on, uh, on museum artifacts. I, I'm guessing you all have that one filed. So this is what the kit looks like that I assembled for the Museums Alaska Conference. And there are several of these left over that will be available uh, probably by lottery if we have more people who want them than uh, we have. But Scott will give you instructions about how to get your hands on one of these puppies after the session. When I assembled these for the conference, uh, I did 24 kits. So I was able to order things in bulk. I was able to wheel and deal a little with the shipping. The state of Alaska has some discounts, that sort of thing. So I was able to get the cost down to $50 a kit. And I was going through and recalculating, if you had to make this whole kit from scratch, how much would it cost? And if I didn't get any deals or any breaks, I could make this kit for under $150. So just to give you an idea about the, the complication of making or not making a kit. And just as a hilarious tangent, I've been getting emails from these folks in South Africa about wanting to get one of these kits and whether I can sell one to them or not, which I can't, but I have to tell them how to make it. So what's in the kit, I'm going to go through and explain to you what's in the kit and, and what's, why these things are in there. Um, I got a little pointer here I'm going to try out. So this uh, B72 uh, acrylic, uh, adhesive medium that's in a solvent it comes from Talus in this little jar. And I provide this jar in the kit as an empty nail polish bottle because it's my opinion that the wide mouth jar allows the solvent to evaporate too quickly. And that's why I like transferring over to the nail polish bottle. This is kind of our main adhesive that we use to attach the labels to the artifacts. And it's kind of the heart and soul of the kit. Any brush bottle is going to work pretty good for this. And the uh, talus bottle here is a brush bottle. But I, like I said, I'm not very fond of how big this opening is. So uh, it's better to transfer it over to a nail polish bottle of some kind. And I show a couple nail polish bottles on the left. And I show a little tiny funnel to do that transferring with, which um, is, is handy. Then I've got a little bottle of acetone, which is what we use to get the labels back off, if we need to get them back off. And it's also the solvent that the adhesive is dissolved in. So if your adhesive gets too thick, you add a little bit of acetone to thin it back down again. If you let your adhesive dry in the bottle, your brush is stuck in that adhesive for good, and you've ruined your bottle, pretty much, just to kind of let you know. The Q-tips are standard drugstore Q-tips. and they are what I like to use with the acetone to get the label back off. So if anybody has any questions on that slide, you can uh, pop up with them. But I'm going to move on to the next slide of what's in the kit. Here we've got the supplies for sewing tags onto artifacts. There's some t artifacts that 
uh, a sewn on tag works better than an adhesive tag. And what I'm showing in the picture are standard uh, cotton thread, needles, sewing scissors, sort of a thing. And then this thing that looks like a piece of paper is actually Tyvek. And Tyvek is a very inert, long-lasting uh, plastic paper, which is what FedEx envelopes and home wrap and that sort of thing is made out of. And you can use the mailing envelopes that are made out of that. Just cut them up and avoid anything that's already printed on or has adhesive. It's a good material for making a sewn uh, label in an artifact. So you'll see on the bottom of this slide, we've got Tyvek, smooth Tyvek. There's also Tyvek that comes with little teeny holes in it, which is nice stuff, but a little tougher to write on. It works if you've got it. Then above it, we've got um, some materials that are also used for sewn in labels. And I've got them labeled <laughs> with what they are. So on the top, we've got um, bias tape, which you can get at the fabric store. It's kind of a cotton ribbon, what we call Twill tape as a loose weave that sometimes folks use uh, in collections management. And below it is a tighter weave twill tape that sometimes is marketed as rug binding at the fabric store. And those are all all right. But I'll point out that I wrote on these four at the same time with the same marker using the same amount of pressure. And you'll see that the smooth Tyvek is really much more legible than the other ones. But they all work if um, that's what you've got. There are um, different kinds of pens that can be used to write on your tags and your bags and your Tyvek and that sort of thing. And these kinds of pens are um, preferable to Sharpies because their uh, formulation is uh, more compatible with long lasting. Sharpies are often described as permanent, but that just means that they're waterproof, not that they're light fast or that they don't bleed or they don't have other issues. I'm also including in this picture uh, a really nifty thing that looks like a blue pencil down here. It's a photo marking pencil. And the advantage to this uh, blue photo marking pencil is if you've got some of the more recently made photographs that are on a plastic carrier and not on a paper carrier, they can be really slick on the back and hard to write the number on. And these photo marking pencils are specifically marketed just for marking on the back of those plasticky photographs. Otherwise, um, a plain number two pencil works great for most paper situations. And then we have plain white vinyl erasers for getting those numbers back off if necessary. So those plain white erasers either come like the magic rub, or you can get them in a, a pencil shape where you peel off the paper at the tip in order to expose more eraser. I would really recommend against using the reddish pinkish erasers because if, if you've ever experienced an old kind of hard eraser, it can sometimes leave that reddish smear on the paper when you're trying to erase. So it's better to use those white final erasers. Hopefully I'm not clipping along too fast here for you. The other thing in this picture are these tags. And you can buy these fancy schmancy tags from museum supply companies, but they usually charge you quite a premium for them. Or you could buy these uh, little tags from Avery or an office supply company or that sort of thing. Sometimes they're also marketed as jewelry tags. And I think that that's a good place to save your money because the uh, office supply or jewelry tags are perfectly adequate and they cost a lot less. And the um, paper is not bad quality paper. It's not as fancy as the museum supply company paper, but it's just fine. I would remove any strings that are not cotton strings. Here you can see that Avery Office Supply tags came with their own cotton strings, which is really great. If the jewelry tags come with the little purple strings, I would take those off in case that dye might run, and I'd replace it with your own string. China markers for marking modern photos. I'm not exactly sure what exactly a China marker has in it. I think they also are called grease pencils. And I would be concerned, going back to our three main concerns, whether or not we can get that back off of a photo if we need to. So I would uh, be more likely to go with the uh, photo marking pencil 
that I think has been tested and vetted by the museum field rather than China markers, although I'm going to make a little note of that and check into China markers and see what they're made out of and, and what folks say about them. So that's a good question. The other thing with those plasticky um, photos is that uh, sometimes if you get a pencil that's just the right amount of dull and you write on it at just the right angle, you can get it to write on the back of a plasticky photo. Or sometimes another trick is if you go with the one of the uh, white vinyl erasers and you make a little eraser mark on the back of that plastic, sometimes you can write on there with pencil too. But you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. A couple comments here on dental floss, which sometimes folks use to tie tags on, is that uh, the Teflon dental floss, which is made of a really inert plastic that has good aging properties, is an OK option for putting tags on. But I wouldn't use standard nylon dental floss because nylon doesn't have great aging properties. So as far as I know, Glide is the main brand name of dental floss that um, is made out of Teflon. But you can feel it's the, the super slick stuff that feels kind of like uh, like plumber's tape, if those of you who are familiar with plumber's tape. This is a little dark, but these are some of the other things that are in the kit. I've got a little scissors. A sewing scissors is a good option. And a couple different kinds of tweezers. The pointier, the better, I think. And I've got a little sheet of the interleaving tissue that we use for printing our labels on. People often ask me what paper I use to print the labels on. And my answer is usually the thinnest, good quality paper you can get to go through either your printer or your photocopier. And then people often ask about, um, does it need to be a laser printer? Like what kind of ink does it need to be? And my opinion on that is that it doesn't matter terribly much what kind of ink it is, because it's going to be completely encapsulated inside your B72. So um, whatever. Uh, piece of office equipment you can get this thin, thin paper to go through is the piece of equipment that you want to be using. And the thin tissue, the problem with thin tissue is sometimes it'll jam in your machine. Sometimes if you feed it through manually or you feed it through one sheet at a time, you can get it to go through. So generally, I recommend that people goof around with uh, Thin, t thin paper and their different machines in their office until they find one that works. And then you make yourself a cheat sheet for which one works and what superstitious uh, set of rituals you have to do to get it to go through the machine. And so far, that seems to have worked for, uh, for everybody that I've talked to. When I print out the numbers on this super thin paper, I print them out in the list in whatever font size that I like. And then I snip it into like a fringe so that they're all still kind of attached to each other and I don't lose them. And I snip them off one at a time as I'm using them. And that has worked pretty well for me. People ask me a lot if they can use something besides B72. Because B72 is a little bit fussy. and the um, in a nutshell version is that water-based adhesives like gel, artist acrylic, medium, and that sort of stuff, all those water-based adhesives are a dream to apply. They make the label nice and limp, and they can form beautifully to the surface. It's easy to clean up your brush. They're easy to get. You can get them at artist supply stores. There's all these reasons that people want to use water-based adhesives. Um, but unfortunately, the solvent-based ones are better for the artifact. They have better longevity. They're reversible more easily. They come off the artifact with less damage. And they're really uh, better for the artifact. So that's kind of the long story short. The picture I have here is all the different adhesives that we tested. And there's a report on that adhesive testing on my web log. But I'm kind of giving you the nutshell. That the solvent-based B72 is unfortunately the better way to go. The adhesive testing, here's the uh, web log that I posted, the results of that adhesive testing. And there's a picture here of all the artifacts that I was testing. Um, you can't see terribly well, but we tested for how easy they were to remove if you need to get the label off, if they fall off in a flood, if they fall off in high relative humidity, if they deteriorate, if you have them in high heat, and if they come off with abrasion, like 
rubbing against each other or that sort of thing. So that's all the testing that we did with these materials, which were um, pennies, stone, pottery, tooth, bone, and wood. Here's, here's a piece of bone that I had these labels, all these different adhesives all over that guy. This is what happens with a lot of the water-based adhesives. They're water-based and they're easy to clean up in water when they're still wet, but when they're dry, they're not reversible in water anymore. You have to use a solvent to try to reverse them, and they don't fully dissolve in the solvents. They only swell up and become like a gel. And with porous materials, like this bone, for example, they swell up and they get in the pores of the bone, and when you try to get the label back off, it peels off some of the surface of the bone when you pull the label off, because it's not fully dissolved, it's just turned into a gel. And it also, because it's just turning into a gel, can be kind of difficult to get off. So here's one of those um, water-based labeling materials that um, just swelled up, and you really have to scrape and peel, and it's not coming off very easily. The other thing that happens is a lot of the water-based adhesives are um, PVA emulsions, and they're um, pretty alkaline. And they, they often include ammonia in their formulation. And ammonia causes copper alloys, for example, to corrode. So after this label, which was Roplex, Roplex is a conservation grade adhesive that's widely used in museums. And you can see this Roplex turned um, the label, or the adhesive, got a little bit green. That's because it's pulling copper ions out of the um, out of the penny, and it also made that area of uh, corrosion and discoloration on the penny. And that happened within days of putting the label on. This is one of the examples of the way the uh, labels used to be done in museums. They would put on a barrier coat of B72, or if it was a darker item, uh, they would use something light, like white paint or white out, or sometimes B72 with a tint of um, white paint in it. But here, the stone artifact had a uh, swatch of white out put on it. And you can maybe see in the picture that somebody had to rub pretty hard with a ballpoint pen to get the number to write on there. So with this artifact, I'm concerned that it's going to be difficult to get that white material fully off and out of the pores. And I'm also concerned that because they had to press so hard with that ballpoint pen, they might have scratched into the stone a little bit. This is one of our big, two of our big complaints with the old B72 system. One of the complaints is that um, it's hard to see dark numbers on a dark artifact. And another complaint was that sometimes the B72 would bubble. I've had a lot of conversations with other conservators and museum folks about this bubbling issue with B72. And nobody exactly knows why it happens. But I believe that it happens when your B72 is a little bit too thick, and you might need to add in a little acetone. Or it happens when you've got too much airflow over the surface of your artifact, and it's causing the solvent to evaporate out too fast. So either way, you've got little bubbles that are getting trapped before the uh, barrier level layer there can dry out. Another complaint that we have is that sometimes when you put on the top coat of B72, you smear the ink. This is another um, major complaint about this method is that the solvent in the B72 sometimes is able to dissolve the solvent-based inks that get used um, in some printers and photocopiers and, and that sort of thing. Let's go back for just a second here. The solution to this smearing issue, in my opinion, is to either uh, use a different kind of an ink or to use a different kind of a top coat. Now, some museums, for example, I think uh, Marnie Leist at the Elliptic Museum uses a method where there's a barrier coat, a bottom layer of B72 that they stick the label to, and then they do a top coat of something water-based after it's dry. Now, that kind of gives you the, uh, a lot of the benefits of the water-based coating materials and all the benefits of the solvent-based barrier coat. So that's kind of a nice uh, one-two punch there. This is a new uh, 
uh, list of things that I made up for just this talk here for you folks as a gift. Um, I've kind of listed the four main methods that I use to label artifacts and exactly which artifacts I use these methods on. So you'll see that a lot of the materials in the museum we can label with B72. If um, we've got something that's papery, I, I like to use pencil because it comes off really nicely. Um, and I also use the, that on the backs of picture frames, too, because they don't tend to have a, a coating of varnish. It just tends to be plain wood. And often you can see a pencil number on the back of a, uh, a picture frame. The sewing method, which is good for basically anything that's uh, fabric-y, and the tag method. And the tag method is kind of my last option for things that I really can't safely put a label on. And that tends to be um, things that either have a surface that a label isn't easy to read on or have a surface that could be damaged by the adhesive of the, of the label. So let's uh, pop forward to a few of um, the labeled items. The B72 we like to use was originally formulated for um, metals, actually as a metals coating uh, to prevent corrosion and tarnishing and that sort of thing on metals. So it goes beautifully on metals, and it comes off of metals pretty beautifully, too. So here's an example of that paper label on, the, um, on a silver bracelet. Here's an example of uh, pencil on the back of a print. You can also see this poor print also has some uh, unfortunate adhesive issues. But I've got it lightly in pencil on the back. And when you're um, writing a number on something in pencil, it's good to write on a hard surface and have a pencil that's not super sharp, because you don't want to scratch into the paper. And you also don't want to emboss the number into the surface of the paper, which happens if you're uh, writing on the paper on a very soft surface. It kind of allows you to push in too far. You'll also see here an uh, example of redundancy. The number of the print is also written on its storage folder. This is the sewing technique that I like to use. So here I've got a strip of Tyvek, which I would have first written the number on. But I just got a, a bare strip here, for an example, and my own sweatshirt, which was my demo piece. I try to go through existing holes. I try to go through existing seams. And if I have to sew through the fabric, I try to use a needle that's got a pretty blunt tip. Usually they're called ball points to go between the fibers of the weave and, uh, and not actually through an individual yarn. So in between the warp and the weft and the little interstices of the weave, I really don't want to make new holes in my artifacts, if at all possible. And if I can't, sew a tag on without making a new hole, I probably will think twice about sewing on a tag. So the way that these tags go on, you could make lots and lots of teeny little stitches and make them really beautiful. But I essentially like to put one simple loop on each end of the tag so that if I want to take the tag off, all I have to do is snip at those two spots and the tag comes right off. The typical place people look for, look, the typical place people look to find the tag is the place that they expect to find tags in garments anyway. So usually it's at the back of the neck. When artifacts are in storage or they're hung up, I like to have people be able to find those numbers without having to handle the artifact more than necessary. So here I've got redundant labels hanging from the uh, hangers. So as we're going through the closet, looking through for which item I'm looking for, I don't have to be pulling them and stretching them on their hangers to find their numbers. With rolled textiles, of course, you don't want to have to unroll them and seek out their numbers. There's a system or a trick where sometimes with a rolled textile or with a painting, that something that's large and it's hard to hunt down the numbers, sometimes they'll put numbers in opposite back corners. So number
How about now? Am I back? Oh, excellent. Yeah, I got something where they seem to kick me off for a minute, but I seem to be back. So the last thing I was mentioning was that there was uh, a museum I was at that had great little thumbnail photos on each of their little tags, which is something I could only dream that we would ever get to here. But. I seem to have lost the ability to forward the slide. So Daniel, could you give me my next slide? Thanks. I have seen people try to attach labels, paper labels, uh, with adhesive to baskets. But unfortunately, they tend to be hard to read, and they can be hard to get on and off. So if possible with baskets, I tend to prefer putting on a tag. I like to do that also with leather and skin where possible, because I, I think it's difficult to get adhesives to stick properly to leather, and it's difficult to get them back off again without leaving a mark. On the backs of paintings, I think it's really nice to add a redundant tag and uh, slide that um, tag over to the edge a little further than that, because it's nice not to have to pull your paintings out. I'm going to go forward and show you this next little guy. See here we've got them hanging up on a rack, and you can see it's a uh, paper tag without having to pull the thing off the rack, which is really nice. I'll point out that this guy also has some other strange label over here with a number on it. And unless I have a really good reason, I never take any of those old numbers off, because they might mean something to somebody. There's that nice tag. Some things are just impossible to label at all, like a box of muskox fur. So you just have to label the container that it's in and look for redundancies, like have a good image of it in your database, have some good notes about it, like have multiple ways to find it. I love this box of muskox fur. What a random item, huh? Here's another thing is if you've got really teeny tiny things that are, are next to impossible to label individually, making them a little housing and labeling the housing is a good way to go about doing it. I would also look for redundancies and having images of these that are labeled and that sort of thing. This is a collection of glass beads that is at the um, Olytik Museum in Kodiak. And they've used these little enclosures that are usually used for coins to individually hold these little glass beads. You might be able to see in this picture that the um, cardboard that these are made out of is probably not the greatest quality cardboard. But since glass beads really don't care much about acidity, uh, this is a pretty good housing solution for these individual beads. Plastics. Here's some random plastic items I just had around my lab, and I went um, at each one of them with a uh, Q-tip with acetone on it. And you'll see that with this one, you see that little um, smeared up area? That's after it dried. It, it messed up the surface. Same thing with the cellulose nitrate handle. You can see that um, messed up area right there. Um, and even if the um, surface of the plastic is not disfigured, as in the case of the cassette tape over here and the uh, rubber cockroach over here, you'll see that pigment came up on those swabs anyway, which means there's some damage happening to those plastics. Plastics are really difficult to identify which plastic exactly they are. And without knowing exactly what plastic you have, it's hard to know exactly which solvent or adhesive you can put on them without harming them. So I err on the side of not putting adhesive labels on plastics at all, but labeling them with tags or with redundant housings. Here's a vinyl banner that was a statehood banner in the Alaska State Museum collection. And luckily, it's got a nice big metal grommet. So I've got the option of either making a teeny tiny adhesive label for the metal grommet and labeling that part of the artifact, or putting a big old tag through that grommet hole. But I wouldn't label the vinyl. 
Here is a clock that is at Wendy Goldstein's museum over in uh, Valdez, the Whitney Museum. And the wood of the clock you know, might have a finish on it. I probably don't want to put an adhesive on something that's got like a varnished surface that I could disturb with my solvent. But luckily, the back of the clock had a nice metal hinge. And I was able to put the number right on the metal hinge. So for those artifacts that we call composite objects or mixed media objects, you can often find a part of it that's safe to label. If you've got an artifact that's really large or really heavy, we try to locate the label in a place that you don't have to move it in order to find the label. So this big stone sculpture, you would probably label it somewhere low on the back of it. So with the placement of labels, the things we're keeping in mind are to have it not show up when we're taking a picture of it or putting it on exhibit, but be pretty easy to find when the registrar or the curator needs to find the number. The um, redundant housing thing is really nice for not having to handle artifacts any more than necessary as well. We have a whole drawer full of these rattles, and some of them are not um, totally stable. They don't all stay together. They have loose pieces and that sort of thing. They all have their own individual number directly on them. But we've also done these redundant housings where there's a number on each of their little pallets that holds them. So we can easily tell opening the drawer which one is which without having to handle them at all. Likewise, these dishes have labels on their undersides, but we have these redundant little cards. And each little card in the bowl has the number on it in order to tell us what they are kind of at a glance. So that's a real time saver and um, makes us have to handle the artifacts less frequently. So here's my little review here that labels should never harm the artifact. Labels should be durable but reversible. So we need it to stay on as long as we want it to, which I'm kind of aiming for 100 years is what I'm aiming for. And they need to be able to come off easily as soon as we need them to come off. And redundancy is good. So that's kind of my, my whoop, let's not go to the next chat session. Let's see if Daniel can show us the little video that I've got. I've got a short video that shows me putting on a landing strip of B72, picking up the label with the brush, sticking it on, and doing a top coat. So this might be the first time we've tried to do a movie, a little film in the chat session. And if it doesn't work, it's only 20 seconds and so no big deal. But if it does work, that would be kind of fun and exciting for museum chat. So right now, I'm seeing um, something that just says multimedia on my computer. Is anybody else seeing the video? So people are still figuring out if the clip is playing for them or not, um, which is kind of interesting. I didn't get it on my computer. It might also depend to some degree on what kind of um, video playing stuff is on everybody's individual computer. But I've got a question here from Wendy Goldstein on how would you label a polar bear on the claw, maybe? And uh, a couple thoughts on that. The claw would be a safe place to label it. And polar bear claws are pretty big. 
and they tend to have a kind of concavity on the very underside of the claw, kind of a scooped out little channel. And I would uh, probably put the label in that scooped up little channel underneath the claw. But unfortunately, um, the question is also where are people going to look for a label? So um, if it's a polar bear mount, like a taxidermied mount, I would think about a place on the mount. Like if he's on a base or something like that, I would consider that. Or if there's a place to tie a tag, I would think about that. Otherwise, um, there would be that redundancy thing where I would just have images of him in the record with his number all over it. But his fur is uh, pretty unlabelable. The moose antler is a good place. Wendy's saying that she labeled the moose's antler, which is a a good spot. The problem with uh, taxidermy is it uh, confounds people where to expect to find the label. And if it's on exhibit, something like a big tag tied around a bird's leg just isn't very attractive. I've seen um, for a while at the Juno Douglas City Museum, there were photographs of exhibits where on the photograph they had a little sticker on each uh, item in the photograph that had its exact number. So that was a really helpful way for them to do inventories on exhibits without having to get in there and search for numbers on every individual, individual object. And Wendy Goldstein is saying um, they thought about the mouth of the taxidermied animal, but they're likely made of plastic. Yeah, more contemporary taxidermy animals' mouths are often made of plastic. And the older ones tend to be plaster that's been painted. And so you could get a number on there, but then getting it off without messing up the surface would be kind of ugly. It's also hard to imagine where you would stick the number that people wouldn't see it. Although the idea of a polar bear eating numbers is kind of funny to me. <laughs> So Scott's encouraging questions, especially questions along the lines of um, products for your own labeling kits or products you're using that you want to know if they're safe, or really challenging items that you would like to know if you can um, put labels on or not. I'll tell you another uh, couple tricks with the labels is that with the little paper labels, if you have to label something curved, it's nice to take your a uh, little paper label, and with your thumbnail, scratch the underside of the label in the way that you do with party ribbon to make curls. And that will make your label be curved in a way that will help conform to the surface. And that helps the label not snag and pop off. The big reason for using the uh, super thin paper is because it's more likely to stay uh, nicely conform to your surface and not have uh, a thickness to it that's likely to snag and pop off. If you just used photocopier paper, for example, that would be all right from a, a longevity and um, material standpoint, but it's just too thick to really stay on the surface nicely. The other thing people do sometimes is snip off the corners of their label, which is really persnickety but it um, gives less of a spot for snagging and popping off the label.
any suggestions for phonograph cylinders. Now, if I understand right, phonograph cylinders are made out of wax. And some waxes respond to solvents, although waxes tend to respond more to solvents that are made from petroleum distillates. So solvents that are um, uh, in petroleum distillates tend to be things like B67 and things like that, and not B72. But my concern would be, could we get the label back off the phonograph cylinder without damaging it? Um, so that would kind of be my question. We had an issue here that I haven't quite solved yet. We have a bunch of milk cartons and ice cream cartons from Matanuska Made, the dairy company that used to be in uh, the Wasilla area. I'm not sure exactly where it was, but we've got these vintage um, containers that are made out of paper that's all waxed on the outside. And I'm trying to decide whether or not I, I feel comfortable actually sticking a label on them or not. And the way I'm going to determine that is I'm going to take one of my little Q-tips with some acetone on it, and I'm going to go on the underside of the milk carton. And uh, along a seam, where I'm not going to see it very well, I'm going to rub a teeny bit of acetone in a teeny little spot, like about the size of a uh, pumpkin seed or smaller, a teeny little spot with the um, swab with acetone on it, and I'm going to see if I'm uh, disfiguring that wax coating in any way with the acetone. If I'm getting it clean, if I'm messing with it, if it's moving around, if it's soluble in any way, then I probably won't put a label on it. But if the acetone seems to do absolutely nothing to the wax coating on the bottom of the carton, then I probably will use B72 to individually label the bottoms of those cartons. One of the tricky things, of course, with anything wax is things don't stick to it very well. Wax is kind of waxy and slick. And so once I get a label on the bottom of that Matanuska made milk carton, I'm probably going to poke at it a little bit with my fingernail and see if it just pops right back off again. Because a label that doesn't stay on your item is pretty useless. It's kind of like those really old labels that people used to put on files and filing cabinets. When you open the filing drawer and you go through those um, file folders and the labels just all pop off as <laughs> you're flipping through them, that's not terribly useful. So. For folks that are interested in um, more references, on the website, I've got a few references listed. There is uh, um, an organization that has a numbering class, a labeling and numbering class. I think they just sent something around just today. I think it's 400 and some dollars, and you get a kit and online instructions for numbering, but their website has a bunch of tips. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Ellen? I, I can okay, hear you. Okay, good. Well, I had to re-up my mic because it wasn't working. I see. Anyway, um, if there are there any more questions from from the participants? Because we have uh, just a few more minutes, and then I will go over how you guys can get one of you can get in the drawing for one of these kits that we have here. So I see that it looks like Jerry may be typing a question. Yes, the answer to that is um, 
it will be recorded and the link to the recording will be on our uh, chat web page in a few days. Okay, Larue. Yeah, that's fine. You can um, you can watch the whole thing. That's the beauty of uh, having this recorded. It will be there for posterity. So it looks like Addison may be typing something. So I'll wait for his uh, question or comment, and then I will uh, we'll go over how to get into the drawing. Addison has a question. Yeah, the um, B67. B67 is uh, another um, resin-based uh, acrylic sort of adhesive that's in solvent, but instead of being in acetone, it's in a petroleum distillate. And uh, B67 tends to be used for labeling things that are sensitive to acetone, but not sensitive to petroleum distillates. So sometimes people use that to label uh, things like plastics, or if they have a situation that um, maybe the, heat, the temperature and humidity are going to be really high, or in, in some other situations like that. I've never used B67, and in situations where plastics come into play and waxy surfaces, um, I get really cautious, and I might consider testing out B67, but it's not something I keep regularly in my kit. The other time that people use B67 or some of those other adhesives is for a top coat when the B72 and acetone top coat is causing the ink to smear. So sometimes it's used as a top coat. And I think you can use a lot of different things for a top coat because that's not really touching your artifact if you do it right. And the issue with B67 is um, that it's not, it doesn't quite have the longevity of B72 when they tested it, so it can become harder to remove over time, but it, it's a pretty good uh, resin, but it's not as good as B72. So it's just in the same class of resins, it just uh, get, it goes down in a different solvent, it dissolves in a different solvent, and it's not quite as uh, stable. So it looks like Mary Alice has a question. So we have this will be the last question. We have we'll take Mary Alice's question or comment, and then uh, we will uh, we'll go on to uh, our lottery. Right. So. Um Mary Alice is asking about B72 for the barrier coat and the top coat. And ideally, that's the way to go, that you would have um, a barrier coat that's a little bit bigger than your label. You put your label down on it. I also like calling that the landing strip, that barrier coat. And then you have your label down, and then you have a top coat that's about the same size as your bottom coat. So you've got your label sealed in around all four of its edges. The time when I wouldn't use B72 as the top coat is if I can't solve the ink smearing issue or the um, bubbling issue, and it's not performing well. And in that situation, I would consider using some other um, adhesive as the top coat. OK, so great. Thank you very much, Ellen. That was really good. and. Um, we're good in the time. Ellen was able to get all of that information in, and we're right on time. Uh, so I'd just like to um, tell everybody that if, you, um, if you're interested in getting in the drawing to get one of these kits, there are some requirements. Um, one is you have to be a member of Museums Alaska, because Museums Alaska has paid for um, the, uh, the kits and everything through a grant that they received. So you have to be a member of Museums Alaska. You um, have to have participated in this chat. And um, was there anything else, Ellen? Those are the two things. And well, you have to send me an email. 
that, that has your name and your address on it. Um, and um, we will put all the names into a hat and draw them out. The other um, requirement was that um, you're not getting a second kit, right. if possible. If you've already taken my workshop and gotten the kit, it's not really fair to double dip. Yeah. And so, and I meant to say, it's either you or the museum that will be using the kit. So some of you who are interns, if, you, um, if your museum where you were working is a member of Museums Alaska, then you can get the kit for the museum, not for yourself, but for the museum um, to use. And you could use it while you were there. So um, everybody should send me a, an email who wants to be put in the drawing. And I will put my email address down here. Uh, and it's also available on our website, but it's just scott.carly at alaska.gov. Uh, so there's my email address. So you have to be a member of Museums Alaska. You have to have um, not already gotten a kit, uh, because that would be double dipping. And you um, will need to have participated in this uh, workshop or in this web chat. And you need to send me an email that says you would like to be put in the drawing for the kit and have your address on that. Because as soon as we do the drawing, we'll want to have everybody's address where we can send them that kit. And as Ellen said, this kit is worth, like if you went out and tried to do all of this, it's worth 100 to $150. So it's, a, it's kind of a worthwhile thing to do. Does everybody understand that? How about clapping if you understand that? Yay. Smiley face is good, too. Doesn't look like everybody understood it, but almost everybody did. <laughs> OK, great. Well, again, thank you very much uh, to Ellen. Uh, thank you very much to Daniel for his um, technical support. Daniel's always uh, in the background making things run smoothly. And uh, thanks to Ellen for putting this together. And thank you all for participating. And there will not be a chat session in August, as you notice um, from the last slide. The, um, we're, uh, Ellen and I are traveling during that time, so we're just going to let that one go. And we will resume again with a chat on September 12th at 11 AM. That will just be a regular question and answer or comments or discussion chat. So please mark that on your calendar. And thank you very much. So we'll see you all later. Bye now. <laughs>